Thank you, Hakan, and I'm, I'm very, very honored to be here. Um, uh, honored to be here both to address you, but also for the, um, for the chance of receiving an honorary doctorate, uh, honorary doctorate uh, tomorrow. When I was a graduate student studying in philosophy, I uh, got a master's degree in Cambridge, but I was considering getting a doctorate, and it was explained to me that getting a doctorate was, um, was like a very, was a marriage that was preceded by a very long engagement um, and I'm a very old man, so engagements were celibate engagements. So a very long celibate engagement, and then you would get married. And um, uh, I was not interested in that uh, at all. I was I was happy about the idea of getting married, but not the idea of the seven-year celibacy. So um, I chose not to get an honor uh, to get a doctor. Um, um, but uh, I feel like what's happening tomorrow is something like the marriage, more like what we call in America, though, a shotgun marriage, which is the <laughs> urgent marriage that has to happen. And so what I want to do today is to frame this talk around this metaphor of marriage. And in our tradition, all marriages are framed in the following way. You need something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue. Um, and that's the frame of the talk I have for you today. So here's old. <clears throat> Um, about 15 years ago or so, a number of us in the United States were trying to get people to recognize the way in which the things people were celebrating about the internet were contingent. They were dependent upon a particular architecture that the designers of the internet had for completely different reasons embraced. That this space, which was referred to as cyberspace, where libertarians were celebrating the impossibility of government regulation. People like John Perry Barlow with his declaration of independence from governments of the world were celebrating a space whose characteristics were very tenuous and contingent. And that the designs of this infrastructure could easily be redesigned. And indeed, as I argued in my book, code and other laws of cyberspace, all of the normal expected incentives of governments and business would be to redesign this space to increase the capacity of governments and business to regulate behavior in this space. So even if it was true, circa 1995, that this was a space where behavior could not be regulated, there was no good reason to believe that it would remain like that unless an activist civil rights movement could be born that would defend the liberties that the internet gave. So this is the sense in which the code of this space was the law of this space. And I tried to explain this concept in a way that embraced a broader conception of regulation. Uh, and so I began a series of talks, and these are the original slides. It was this font that I began this all with. <laughs> Uh, this idea of code is law. And there are two particular points I thought were central to this. One, to get people to recognize what things regulate and to then recognize the way in which laws affect those things that regulate. So what things regulate? So again, the original slides. Take this pathetic red dot, the target of regulation. The normal way an American lawyer thinks about this pathetic red dot is to focus on the way in which the law regulates that entity. So the law regulates with ex uh, ante rules imposed, enforced ex post by the state. So rules like do not murder. That's a rule that's announced before anyone murders. And then if you commit murder, you're punished by the state afterwards. Uh, that's the dynamic of that modality of regulation. But in addition to that modality, there are other modalities of regulation. So norms are a modality of regulation. So the norm that says that I am not permitted to wear a dress either today or tomorrow, you know, a norm which I understand is pretty solidly enforced tomorrow at least during the ceremony. I'm not allowed to wear a dress. Um, um, uh, of course, it's a very different sense of I'm not allowed to wear a dress. It's similar to laws in the sense that the text ante, I know of it today. I know that rule today. 
But it's enforced tomorrow, I assume, not by the state. I wouldn't be arrested if I showed up in a dress. But people would treat me differently. They would think differently about it. They'd punish me in a certain way because of my deviation from the expectation of this rule. And then in addition to norms, we can think about the way markets regulate. Markets you know, that would say, I'll pay you $300 versus $3,000 for a particular act would induce a different level of commitment by me to that act. This type of regulation is almost simultaneous. It's in the image of the bidding auction of a market enforced by property and contract rules, themselves, of course, embedded within a legal structure. So I'm not saying this is independent of the law, but it has a dynamic which functions in a way differently from how the law functions. And then finally, architecture as a kind of regulation, by which I mean the found design of a space a space that's experienced either physically or virtually in the sense in which we experience space in, on the net. This too has a simultaneous constraint. It is the constraint of this physical object that ex I experience as I press on it, uh, uh, enforced by, I don't know, let's just call it God that creates this kind of constraint. So my favorite MIT uh, bumper sticker, 299,792 kilometers per second, it's not just a good idea, it's the law, right? <laughs> Speed of light. So uh, this in sense of the ambiguity in the notion of law embedded in this one bumper sticker is the same sense of ambiguity I want to raise by pointing to the regulatory characteristic of architecture. Okay, so if you think of these four modalities of regulation, one consequence is to make the lawyer feel very small, uh, which is a bad thing especially if you're a law professor in an American uh, law school. So that led me to a second point around this conception of the modalities that regulate. The point that the law actually has a role in affecting the way these other modalities regulate. So think about the regulation of smoking. Um, we can imagine uh, the law, for example, um, in California, the law took an aggressive stand to try to change the norms around smoking to try to make people who smoke um, stigmatize people who smoke as weak or uh, sick or in some sense other than normal people in California. And it was quite effective. And as a, as a uh, vigilant anti-smoker, I was all for that totalitarian propaganda that the state of California imposed upon its citizens. But that was one way in which the law tried to intervene to change norms to reinforce a norm of suggesting people should not smoke. The law can also regulate the markets, uh, as it does in the United States. Of course, we tax cigarettes. We also subsidize tobacco production, but put that aside. We tax cigarettes, so we raise the price of cigarettes so as to exclude at least some people or make it easier for some people to choose not to smoke on the basis of the trade-offs that that would impose. And the law can also regulate the architecture of cigarettes, as the FDA tried to do under the Clinton administration, where the FDA tried to characterize a cigarette as a drug delivery device, nicotine was the drug, and if it was a drug delivery device, then the FDA would have the right to regulate the drugs delivered by a cigarette and thereby mandate a lower drug delivery product so that the architecture of the cigarette would change, thereby the drug addictiveness of that cigarette would change, therefore the architecture was being used in a way to reinforce the norm that people should not be smoking. So all of these were opportunities for the state, either directly regulating or indirectly regulating through these different modalities, and that had the consequence of raising the significance of the law in the equation once again. But the question here, obviously, then, was which mix of modalities work best? Which mix work best? Because it's always a choice. So think, for example, about a couple familiar cases from the history of the internet. 1992. <coughs> This man, Tim Berners-Lee, <clears throat> looking at the internet, decided to create what we now think of as the World Wide Web. <clears throat> Created it as a stateless system, meaning you couldn't at any moment understand the state of the system in the previous instance. So for example, if you'd gone to the stateless version of the internet in Amazon.com and tried to buy 500 copies of my book, Free Culture, um, uh, and then went to, quote, check out in that world, the system would have forgotten that you had bought or tried to buy 500 copies of my book, Free Culture, because it wouldn't know you were the same person who had signaled you wanted 500 copies before. 
That, of course, is a very bad thing. Buying 500 copies of my book is a good thing. So if it <laughs> disables you from doing that, that's bad. It's a bad thing for commerce, gen commerce generally that the architecture doesn't facilitate easily identifying you were the person who signaled he wanted 500 books before, even if it was a very good thing for privacy. Because an architecture that doesn't make it simple to know you were the person who did something one second ago makes it very hard for commerce or the government to track your behavior on that network. So what was the solution to that particular problem? Cookies were the solution to that particular problem. 1994, Netscape launches a protocol which we refer to as cookies, this protocol for HTTP to make it possible for them to know you were the guy that was just here before. That protocol was good for commerce, indeed essential for commerce, even it was also bad for privacy, since now all of our behavior, as it's been extended and all the ways in which this protocol has been extended, are e is easily traceable. It's easier to buy and easier to track. Okay. The difference between these two worlds is a difference of the just change in code. It's the protocols of the infrastructure that facilitates that difference. So we can say the behavior is now traceable because of this architecture which has changed, but the architecture has changed because of the demands or the needs of the market that made it change. So in this sense, the market drove the change in architecture and that change in architecture altered the experience, the freedom, the privacy of those who would live in the place we call the World Wide Web. Here's a second example. 1999, this man, Cyril Pari, was in Paris checking his um, Gmail, his, not Gmail, whatever this was back then. I can't remember what that was, Hotmail. Um, and, uh, uh, dis and had this experience of looking at this and thinking, this is very stupid. It's stupid, he said, that as I check my Hotmail, I'm being advertised 1-800-Flowers, which at that time was only in the United States. Why is it in Paris I'm getting an advertisement for flowers from a company that sells flowers in the United States? And the answer was that the internet was, quote, borderless. It was a feature of the original design protocols, TCP IP, that you didn't know who someone was or what they were doing or where they necessarily were doing it. We didn't know, therefore, that he was in Paris, or 1-800-Flowers didn't know he was in Paris, and therefore didn't know there was no reason to try to sell him flowers while he was in Paris. So this protocol produced an inefficient, from the commerce perspective, consequence, and that inefficiency was the mother of invention for Cyril, because he then thought, even though IP was not necessarily linked to geography, there's no reason in which it couldn't be. Indeed, you could imagine building IP mapping that linked IP addresses to geography. You could imagine building a table that kind of tied particular IP addresses to particular places in the world. And through this architecture of IP mapping, make it possible for sites to understand where people are as they access, that come from as they access those sites. And he built a system which very quickly was between 95 and 98% accurate. Uh, and he built it and marketed it, and it became quite successful for him. And a problem for companies, even though ultimately very valuable for companies, initially a problem for particular companies, and in particular for Yahoo France. Because Yahoo France got into a fight with the French government because they had an auction site. The auction site auctioned all sorts of material, including Nazi propaganda, Nazi propaganda cannot be sold in France, according to French law. Uh, but Yahoo said, we have no way to know who someone is or where they're coming from, so we have no way to distinguish between French people who might want to buy Nazi propaganda and Americans who want to buy Nazi propaganda. Uh, and in America, it's completely legal to buy Nazi propaganda, so therefore we should not be forced to get rid of all Nazi propaganda just because you in France don't want your citizens to get access to it. But in the case brought against Yahoo France, um, the government brought Cyril in to testify. And Cyril demonstrated his technology and said, look, I can show you your servers are in Sweden, Yahoo France. Your servers are sitting in Sweden. And I can show you with this technology that you can tell precisely where people are coming from as they access your Swedish servers. And it would be trivially easy for you to say, therefore, that if you're coming from France, 
to access the servers in Sweden that call themselves Yahoo France, then we can block you from accessing auctions about Nazi paraphernalia, even if accessing it from the United States would be perfectly legal. So the judge ordered uh, France, uh, ordered Yahoo France to block French citizens from accessing this material. Even if it was legal in the United States, it was illegal in France, and thus France must block access. Okay, so once again, we have a market incentive which changed the architecture. The market incentive to be able to identify where people were changed the architecture, IP mapping. And then the law took advantage of that changed architecture to increasingly regulate people on the basis of where they were according to the local norms of the legal system. So we have market changing the architecture and then the law taking advantage of the market's change to further change the architecture to regulate people differently. Right. In both of these cases, there's a link to the architecture and underlying legal policy. The law and the market work together in a way to facilitate this linking of architecture and legal policy. These two cases and in many other cases as well, the point is just this, this architecture has these policy consequences. That's the critical first point in this idea of code as law. That's the old stuff. So now something new. 15 years later, this point, I think, is more important than ever. But what's important about this point is increasingly missed by people who talk about it. Because the lesson from code is law is not that we need to regulate code, or at least not necessarily that we need to regulate code. It's that the lesson is we have to find the right mix of law and market and norms and uh, code or here's an updated version of that chart, um, the mix that would achieve the legal objective in the most efficient way consistent with the values of a legal system. Uh, so for example, think in the context of innovation. Uh, the internet has an architecture as it was born. It's an architecture called an end-to-end -end architecture. What that architectural premise means is that the intelligence within that network is pushed to the end or the edge of the network, leaving the middle of the network as simple, or as some put it, as stupid as possible. Now, an architecture design like that has consequences. Um, as described by my colleague Barbara von Shavik uh, in her book, Internet Architecture and Innovation, consequences that it enables innovation. Indeed, it enables a certain kind of innovation. So if you think about the major innovations in the earliest stages of the internet. Uh, Netscape, started by a kid at the University of uh, uh, Indiana. Hotmail, started by an Indian immigrant in the United States. ICQ, the first peer-to-peer -peer chat system, started by an Israeli teenager and his father. Google, started by kids at uh, Stanford. YouTube started by kids under the age of 30 at least, Kazaa and Skype started by Danes and Swedes, Facebook started by a Harvard dropout, Reddit started by a Stanford dropout, Twitter started by a guy under the age of 30. What is it that unites all of these innovators? They are either kids, dropouts, or non-Americans that define these critical innovators in the early stage of the internet. They are all outsiders. They are outsiders, because that's what the architecture invites. That's what the code of this architecture invites. End-to-end -end invites outsiders, otherwise known as the neutral network, because the network has no capacity to pick who wins and who loses. So that outsiders are encouraged to innovate for this network because they know that their innovation will be accepted if people on the network like it, not if the owners of the pipes or owners of the wireless infrastructure like it. That is the critical design feature that made it so the internet encouraged the innovation we saw it encourage. So today there's a policy debate about how to protect that precise feature of the original design of the internet. The FCC, this is the debate around network neutrality regulations. It's become a very political fight. The Republicans have taken it up to fight network neutrality regulations. And the question becomes, how do we protect this feature of the original internet? And what how means here is which of these modalities should we use? 
But the way the debate has developed, this question has been framed as if these are independent of each other. So some say we need to use the architecture by regulating code to make sure the code protects this. Others say we ought to change the market incentives to create companies that have the incentive to facilitate neutral networks. The question here is which uh, individually works better, but the focus of my framework of code is law, which says which mix of modalities makes sense, is never asked by the regulators or by those challenging the regulations. The framework of how do we integrate these modalities is not at the center of the regulatory framework. Um, same thing in the context of creativity. There's a certain picture of culture I've tried to push, or did many years ago, that we distinguish between culture, which is read-only culture, versus read-write culture, writing on top of this, uh, uh, this way that um, uh, computer technologists speak about access to information on a network or in a data system, read-only versus read-write. Um, and this distinction was suggested to me by very early testimony of this great um, musician, John Philip Sousa, in 1906, when he traveled to the United States Congress to testify about this technology, what he called the, quote, talking machines. Now, Sousa was not a fan of the talking machines. Uh, this is what he testified. He said, these, talk these talking machines are going to ruin the artistic development of music in this country. When I was a boy in front of every house in the summer evenings, you would find young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. Today, you hear these infernal machines going night and day. We will not have a vocal cord left, Sousa said. The vocal cords will be eliminated by a process of evolution, as was the tale of man when he came from the ape. Okay, now this is the picture I want you to focus on. People, a picture of young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. This is a picture of culture. It's what I would call read-write culture. It's a culture where people participate in the creation and the recreation of their culture. In that sense, it's read-write. And Sousa's fear was that the capacity for read-write creativity would be lost because of these, quote, infernal machines. They would take it away, displace it, and in its place, we would have the opposite of read-write creativity, what we could call, using modern computer terminology, a kind of read-only culture, a culture where creativity is consumed, but the consumer is not a creator, a culture in this sense that's top-down where the vocal cords of the millions of ordinary people have been lost because of these infernal machines. So distilled, his claim is a technology, a technology like this or a technology like this produces a culture, a culture much like this as you passively consume stuff produced elsewhere, great stuff produced elsewhere perhaps, but you as the consumer are not part of the creation. Enabling efficient consumption, what we could call reading, but inefficient, at least amateur production, what we could call writing. It's a culture where people listen, not a culture where they speak. It's a culture where they watch, not a culture where they create. Okay, that prediction of the 20th century was pretty spot on. It was an extraordinary century for displacing amateur creativity. Of course, it produced lots of great professional creativity, and I would not deny its value on its own, but it also had this other consequence, which notice, Sousa was a professional creator. He made his money selling music, but he was regretting, lamenting a future, not of professional creativity uh, emaciated, he was lamenting a future where amateurs would not be created. But enter the internet, which has, in my view, revived read-write creativity. At first, of course, all it did was revive or spread read-only creativity. Sites like Napster or the iTunes Music Store were technologies to enable access to culture created elsewhere. But then, very importantly, the platform encouraged explosion of what we think of as read-write creativity from blogs to Twitter to internet becoming interactive, read-write creativity, where people were taking and remixing and sharing their creativity with others. Individuals did this. My favorite is still this Swedish creator. Fear people don't know the references anymore, so it'd be interesting to... My love 
There's only you in my life The only thing that's right My first <laughs> Your every breath that I take Your every step I make Okay, so Soderbergh was a great creator long before the internet, and he's been a great creator since the internet. He's just a great creator, but it's not just creators like him who have been enabled here. It's also communities of creativity that have been inspired by this architecture, this platform for sharing and producing. So, for example, somebody posted, created, and posted this video to the internet. Soldier boy, tell hey, I got the new damn for y'all. Call the soldier boy. Got a punch, then crank back three times from left to right. Uh, 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 so that then inspired this video. Soldier Boy, what's so. Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called the Soldier Boy. You just got a punch, then crank back three times from left to right. Uh, and then that inspired this video. Soldier Boy, what's up? Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called the Soldier Boy. You just got a punch, then crank back three times from left to right. Okay, now that's still an example where people are basically sitting at a computer, but they're sitting at computers all across the world as they're seeing and creating in response to something they've seen somebody else create. Then that's inspired what I think is even the more, much more powerful, interesting example. So I'm sure. People, I hope, remember this great film um, from the 1980s called The Breakfast Club. It was kind of the modern Rat Pack, John Hughes's film. Uh, and you're familiar, I hope, by, with this music by Phoenix, this Domania, um, which has these kind of cool guys with a balloon. I don't know what the balloon is about. But, um, uh, okay, so somebody had the idea, what if we remix these two things together? The Brat Pack, The Breakfast Club, and Listomania. And they produced this, this video. And so that went viral. It became very powerful, very uh, uh, iconic image of what the internet could encourage. But then it encouraged something different. So some people in Brooklyn saw it and decided they wanted to make their own remix of it, following the same arc of it, but doing it in a way that was particular to Brooklyn. So they produced this. And then people saw this on the internet in San Francisco, decided it had to do its own version. So here was San Francisco's. exploded all across the world. People have produced the same video but in their own local version. I don't know what the cousin's version is actually, but in other geographic locations all around. 
around the world. And now you begin to see the way in which this is exactly what Sousa was romanticizing, but in the 21st century. Now again, we have the young people getting together, singing the songs of the day or the old songs, but they're not doing it on a corner in their backyard. What they're doing it on is on a free digital platform network that encourages them to do this and to share their creativity across the world. Amateurs creating in exactly the way that Sousa feared the technology of broadcasting and music on uh, talking machines would destroy. This is important and valuable creativity, but it raises questions for the copyright system. And the first instinct of the copyright system in response to this kind of creativity was to embrace the law and to launch what was described as a quote unquote war against the technologies. A war which my friend, the late Jack Valenti, former head of the Motion Picture Association of America, called his own quote, terrorist war, where the terrorists in this war were apparently our children. Right? And then the second response after the war using the law didn't seem to work so well was to begin to talk about changes in the architecture of the network that would facilitate better control of digital objects so as to facilitate the control of a business model, which is not the business model Sousa was romanticizing, technologies of digital rights management or content ID, which would facilitate once again the ability to lock down the distribution of culture beyond permissions uh, granted, and that would effectively destroy many of the opportunities for remix and creativity, which the technologies was encouraging. My famous example of this is when Johan Soderbergh tried to get permission to release that video broadly. Um, they took it to the creator, um, and the creator said, uh, no, you can't have my permission because it's not that funny. Right? Well, whatever it is, it is certainly that funny, right? So, so the point is, if we facilitate a technology to perfectly control reuse, we facilitate a technology that gives the power to those without a sense of humor. Okay, now, <laughs> the right instinct, the right instinct here would be to think about the way in which the law and the market could better interact, better mix of law and the market to achieve the objectives of copyright law, recognizing those objectives are now two rather than one. It's no longer the objective of copyright law simply to assure that professionals get compensated. That's an important objective of copyright law, and that's got to be preserved too. It's also the objective of copyright law to assure that amateurs have the freedom they need to create and share their creativity, and that knowledge has the capacity to freely be spread across this digital network without being burdened by unnecessary regulations of copyright law. And the question this mixed perspective would ask is, does this mix make sense? And the current mix obviously does not make sense. And the instinct, the right instinct then, would be to restructure the mix to get the right balance to achieve those two objectives. But again, this right instinct in the current environment is simply ignored because, again, I believe the critical insight about code to law is just now not recognized. Okay, now in both of these cases, the instinct of the regulator is bad. No yet, no instinct yet to find the right mix. And so code is law's lesson has, in my view, not yet been learned, at least in the context of those who are implementing policies in response. That's, let's call it the first problem. This is then the second problem. It's our convention, those of us who talk about the internet, uh, to be extremely happy and optimistic about this story. Here it is, us being happy and optimistic. Um, actually, Walmart had a trademark on a smiley face for a while and would forbid people from using a smiley face separate from Walmart advertisements, but we've now won the right to use the smiley face independent of Walmart. So this is not an ad for Walmart, um, it's just a smiley face, okay. The politically correct response for those of us in the digital freedoms movement is to celebrate the internet. We kind of are cheerleaders for what the internet's gonna achieve here. But I think our problem is that we're too much cheerleaders here. We need to be more truth tellers because the reality is there's lots to worry about in the changes that digital technologies have produced. There's plenty of bad, however much good, we can see here. And we must learn how to keep the good while ending as much of the bad as we can, and we have not yet learned how to do this. 
Instead, we as political societies see the bad and we react, and we react in an insanely stupid way to the bads that we see without recognizing we can achieve some of the good in eliminating those bads without destroying the good the network produces. So again, in the context of copyright, we have designed a network to enable sharing. That's what the internet was. It was a network designed to enable sharing. The response of people using that network was to share. The response of the policymakers was to call that sharing piracy. And that sharing then, in the form of like Napster and the others, induced the war, which then of course produced the generation of terrorists. The consequence of that war in the short term may be to destroy entities like Napster, but in the longer term, the consequence of that war was just to explode the instances, the numbers of different Napster-like entities that were trying to achieve the same objective, which was the free sharing of digital copyrighted material. So the result was not a reduction in quote-unquote piracy. Indeed, there's been no effect in the reduction of quote-unquote piracy. This graph demonstrates that internet users do not read Supreme Court opinions because this is the moment at which the Supreme Court firmly declares that free sharing of internet content on, uh, in the United States was illegal, and you see no significant response in, uh, in consequence of that. Instead, it increases the characterization of a generation as criminal, aka our terrorist, um, and that consequence, of course, is unambiguously bad. Now, it is completely obvious that this would happen. Completely obvious, given the architecture of the internet. Mm. Yet policymaking proceeded as if there were no internet, as if it was not the internet we were talking about, oblivious to the consequence of that architecture. Or think an example of the explosion of these leaks, um, or better, we should think of them as floods and emblematic in the WikiLeaks case in the United States. So WikiLeaks, of course, has gone through many stages of its uh, existence. Um, and the most dramatic leak that it affected with the leaking of cable, cables from the State Department was a leak which actually produced lots of harmful information that was released to the public. Um, but the thing to rem recognize is that WikiLeaks, in fact, recognized the potential of the harm in the leaks that they were going to facilitate. Uh, and because of that potential, they made an initial offer. And their initial offer was to the United States government. And they said to the United States government, you can review what we're going to release, and you can tell us what we should not be releasing and tell us why. Uh, and the government refused. And instead, what the government did was to target WikiLeaks to try to destroy WikiLeaks, to label it, as United States senators did, traitors, even though, of course, it's not a citizen of the United States, so it's hard to be a traitor to the United States if you're not a citizen, threatening the death penalty to the leaders of WikiLeaks, describing them as war criminals, uh, and, uh, and then also taking steps to disable the underlying infrastructure by threatening each of these entities with punishments, whether norms or law, which led all of them to drop their support for WikiLeaks, making it increasingly difficult for WikiLeaks to survive. So what's the consequence of that type of behavior? Well, the short-term consequence, again, is that you might destroy WikiLeaks, but the longer-term consequence is just to encourage the explosion of other entities that are serving exactly the function of WikiLeaks. Maybe some of them are better. See this new site, Global Leak, which is trying to do what WikiLeaks did, perhaps in a more regulated way. But lots worse, as this Guardian article points to, this, uh, this effort by the government has just further radicalized hackers, encouraging them to be even more contrary to the legitimate as opposed to the illegitimate objectives of a government. Now, again... It's completely obvious this would happen, <laughs> completely obvious, given the internet. Yet policy making here proceeded as if there were no internet, right? So in both cases, we could have imagined policy making being smarter. The question that should have been uh, asked was, how do we respond? And we begin answering that question by making one fundamental acknowledgement. There is an internet. There is an internet. We have to accept the inevitable, given that fact, 
And so in the context of copyright, we accept the inevitable that there will be sharing on a network designed to facilitate sharing and then compensate artists differently in light of the fact that there will be sharing. So the Greens in Germany pushing their cultural flat rate as a way to compensate artists for the unpermitted sharing of their work is precisely the kind of response that we should be embracing given the fact we understand the inevitable consequence of this architecture. Or in the context of leaks, we have to accept the inevitable data dumps that will come in the future of uh, government uh, uh, misbehavior. And we need to support the best practices for those data dumps responsibly by encouraging those engaging in this practice of releasing data to the public to do it in a way that minimizes harms which everyone agrees should be minimized. But neither of these things do we do. Uh, instead, what we've done is to encourage a policy which is self-destructive and, and ultimately radicalizing the forces that could better be normalized through the process of more sensible intervention. All right. Now, in both cases, there's an insight. And it's the insight that I think is relevant to the discipline which is, uh, has given me the honor of this degree. That we need to step outside of the law, understanding the norms of a social context, the markets within a social context, the architectures within the social context, both to make law possible, those things are the things that make law possible. Without them functioning in a particular way, law just doesn't work. And to make understanding law possible. If we're to understand the way the law will develop, it is by understanding its interaction with the architecture and the norms and the markets that the law finds itself embedded within. Those two insights are the obvious insights it seems to me that comes from understanding the way cyber law has developed. Okay, let me call that new. Now let me do borrow. This is very quick. 1846 at Walden Pond, this man, Henry David Thoreau, wrote this. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. And let's call that one a root striker. That's the borrowed. See, I told you, it was short. Um, now the blue. And blue, you know the sense, because you speak English better than most Americans, um, but blue in the sense of the depressing part. Um, I've proceeded in this discussion as if it was reason that was guiding the decisions of policymakers. It might have been mistaken reason, but still reason. But is it reason that's driving the mistakes these policymakers have embraced? Are these mistakes of reason? I come from a tradition which was established by framers 225 years ago, creating what they called a republic. But by a republic, they meant a representative democracy. And by a representative democracy, they meant a government that would have a branch of government that would be, quote, dependent upon the people alone. So here's the model of government. They have the people and they have the government. I do my own slides. It's cool the way that bounces, right? Mm -hmm. The people and the government. But here's the problem. Our Congress has evolved a different dependency. Not a dependency upon the people alone, but a dependency upon the funders, too. As uh, Hakan described, members of Congress spend 30 to 70 percent of their time raising money to get back into power and raising money not from all of us, but from the tiniest fraction of the 1 percent of us. Basically, 0.05 percent of America are the relevant funders of congressional campaigns. Now, as they do this, like any of us would, they develop a sixth sense a constant awareness about how what they do will affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shape shifters, <laughs> as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not on issues 1 to 10 necessarily, but certainly on issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green, then to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> So the point is, this is a dependency, too, 
But it's a difference in conflicting dependency from a dependency upon the people alone, so long as the funders are not the people, which, of course, the funders are not the people. Now, this fact has a consequence. And the consequence is policies that get bent to the interests of the funders, systemically bent to the interests of the funders. And this is a corruption. It's not corruption in the sense of cash secreted in brown paper bags to members of Congress in violation of bribery laws. It's not a kind of Rob Lagojevich sense of corruption where people are trying to sell their access to power for personal gain. It is instead a dependence corruption. It is the wrong dependence injected into a system intended to have a different exclusive dependency upon a broad range of the people. So when scholars, like I have been at stages in my life, have focused on these issues as if it is reason driving one policy choice versus another, it's fair to say we are fundamentally naive in our approach. For many years, I embraced that naivete. I loved expressing views that denied there was anything more than reason, and tried to take on the judgments being made in terms of the reason or lack of reason behind them. But for the last six years, my focus has increasingly been on not the reason, but on the corruption. Because my view is, until we fix this root, until we are root strikers enough to recognize the common source of this corruption across the range of issues, that Congress must address. We're going to fix nothing, literally nothing. If you think of the wide range of issues that the United States government must address, issues that affect not just us, but you too, most importantly among those, I think, is climate change. None of those issues will be addressed sensibly until we address this underlying corruption. So I entered this field as an, ex as an academic exclusively. But I got stuck in this field increasingly as an activist. And those two roles, academic and activist, pull in different directions and create tension in the life of an academic as in the life of an activist. So I am extraordinarily honored, really, to come here and be honored as the academic, but honored to recruit you to the activist work that must be done if indeed my government doesn't continue to spew its awful policies around the world and in fact, not just the air and the water of your society, but the legal policies of your society as well. Thank you very much for the chance. Thank you.